Thank you, Marlene. She's awesome. Good morning, guys. Um, do you guys want to start a choir together? That was awesome. Thank you so much for coming. I am honored to be here at the MCA Chicago talking about my art. So um, I want to thank also Creative Mornings, the staff, and a special shout out to Marlene Pais and Colin Cypress for having me here today. So I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to just jump right into it. And I'm going to be talking about how I've been flowing with the harmonies for quite some time now. Most of my work, as Marlene said, is based on how harmonies work together, waveforms, particle systems, things of this matter. When I was studying at Columbia College Chicago, I never thought that I would do this and my art would go this way. This, a lot of it had to sink in before I started doing this. What you see here are harmonies interacting with one another, um, waveforms interacting in harmony with one another. But before I start um, talking about how this came to life, um, I want to back um, out a little bit, playing with the boundaries between the visual and the musical is an old game. Harmonies are everywhere and can be translated to every phenomenon in nature. I want to have an insight into why nature works in this particular way. It is my lifelong obsession. Colors can be compared to pure musical tones. Bundles of light are composed of mixtures of colors, just like musical chords are composed of mixtures of musical notes. This analogy runs extremely deep in my craft as an artist, and I intend to explore it for the rest of my days. Pythagoreans were probably the first Westerners to dabble in this realm when they declared the eyes are made for astronomy, the ears for harmony, and these are sister sciences. Theory goes that Pythagoras discovered the foundations of musical tuning by listening to sounds of four blacksmiths' hammers, which produced consonants and dissonance when they were struck simultaneously. It was probably due to the material of the hammer and how hard they were banging. A big influence in my life was the book Harmonies is Mundi by Johannes Kepler, where he explained how there were harmonic proportions of music and astrology how there was rhythm in life, and planets have the rhythm as they repeat their orbits periodically. All this confined in the world of geometry. So for me, math and geometry in music was obvious. It was everywhere. It was very logical to do a transition to go from music composition to making objects and structures that came from sound. I had an urge to make this into materials. So I started from a very simple, um, instead of going all large and having all the piano, I started from something simple, like the interval, the fourth, which you are, guys are familiar, but it sounds like this. It's called the fourth because there's, from one note to the other, there are four steps. But this allowed me to see the relationship between these two notes and the physicality of the notes. Another way to, that I explored these two notes were with sine waves. Sine waves are very particular because they don't have harmonics. Most of the um, sounds we hear every day are full of harmonic content, very, very complex. But sine waves are very pure, and this allowed me to also see sculpturally how I wanted to make these um, objects. 
Here's how it looks and sounds in my oscilloscope if I merge these two notes. That's called a Lisa Ju pattern discovered by Antoine Lisa Ju. But how can I transfer this information into the physical world? Another instrument that helped me um, propel this idea was the harmonograph. Most of you are familiar with it, and if you're not, think of it as a spirograph. Um, this is from the um, 19th century, and if you see, it has two pendulums. Well, actually, three pendulums, but two are, have the information of the frequencies and this circular motion, just like the sine wave as well, and it's merging the information onto the piece of paper. This video I found on YouTube, um, you can see perfectly how it's merging the information and making this cool shape. So once I, if I merge these two notes, C and F, the, the interval, the perfect fourth, you would get this shape. This shape for many will look abstract, but yet it's natural, it's biomorphic, and it has the qualities of pure natural tones. So it's not yet really abstract. Let's see how I made this in my digital harmonograph. Here I'm gonna play with the two frequencies. First, the x-axis and then the y-axis. I'm merging these two informations together, these two notes, C and F. And it looks a little bit chaotic, but once it comes to symmetry, feels good. <laughs> now, I have sort of a structure, and if I um, increase the line and also the thickness, I get a sort of a structural anatomy that I can play with. Now I can further see how it might act with gravity. Gravity is a big thing for uh, people that do sculpture. It's a big thing for us. We fight gravity every day. Even waking up from bed to today, we had to fight gravity. <laughs> so I'm still in two dimensions. What would make three dimensions? There's a C-axis there. This is how it looks in three dimensions. So I input that other axis and so you can see the rotation, you can see how the amplitude, and now it's sort of a sculpture. Yet, I haven't put it out in the physical world. Technology is binded to my art. I, can, I try to get every technology I can to make the, the sculptures that I need, and usually, uh, I tried to make it affordable, but it's never the case. <laughs> so I used a 4500 ProJet. Um, this is a 3D printer the size of a fridge. And what it does, it's, it's amazing. It's, it binds particles of plastic and after 36 to um, 40 hours, I have materialized sound. This is the perfect fourth, um, made in 2015. It was exhibited at the um, Brower Museum in Indiana. Now I have the whole musical world to myself. I have all the waveforms. I can do whatever I want, so I kept going. Here's where an octave looks like. Octave comes from eight, eight notes from one note to the other, and it resembles an eight. Is that a coincidence? I'll let you guys decide that. <laughs> Here's a perfect fifth. And I've been um, playing with simple um, intervals, but what if I add more modulation? Think of it as, as a plane, and if I affect the frequency of that plane that is static and zero, then it warps the space. For me, this is a snapshot of time. Here, the sculptures are able to be made due to their simple and regular vibrational structure. This is internal waveform and figure eight. They were exhibited at Design Week in Saudi Arabia. This next sculpture um, comes from a more of a sculptural background. Just like Michelangelo carved the Pieta out of a, a piece of marble, 
I used a CNC 5-axis machine to carve that. <laughs> <laughs> so from a block of plastic, the CNC machine carved this musical chord into what the structure is. Then we, we also used um, a computer to make the color. I called it Ricardo Pink, but really it's magenta. And um, then we placed it on top of a pine wood. This next Lisa Jew form is called Diabolo Sin Musica, the devil in music. Uh, the beauty about this, and it's called devil in music, back in the days, medieval times, people would think that you are invoking the devil by playing this dissonant chord, interval rather. I think if they would have seen this shape, they would have second thoughts on that. Figure eight, it looks simple in some ways, but if you look at the shadows, it's a little bit more complex. Here's from the top. So far, I've been playing with sine waves. And, but there's so many other waveforms and mixtures of these waveforms, stacking these waveforms. For this next sculpture, I used a triangular wave, the third one that you see here. This is how it sounds. Gnarly. <laughs> Here's in three dimensions. We had to, um, I had to imagine how I'm gonna make this in the physical world and what I thought was rods of steel. So we had to cut every single piece to make this sculpture. It's a 37.5 cubic inches. And here are all the pieces that we had to weld and merge together. I used, I used a 4,000 watt laser to cut the rods of steel. I find it amazing how, I don't know how it doesn't go all the way through and just cuts the, the thickness of the rod. I find it amazing. Here's the final product. I chose um, flat, uh, ultra flat matte black because I wanted to have depth perspective alteration, which means if you see it from this side, the shadows will merge with the color and you, like it really um, plays with your brain when you see it in, you don't know if you're seeing it in two dimensions or in three dimensions. But if you see it from the other side, it will look like this from the side, from, an, from the top, above, from afar, from another side. See, get this diamond shape. I also played with standing waves. Standing waves is a phenomenon that you can find in the macro level and the atomic level. Most of you are familiar with this image. They're called cymatics. And basically, it's a plate with sand. And if you have sound in that plate, you'll see the nodal patterns where the waves pass by. Robert Hooke and Ernst Kladny at the 18th century um, discovered that. Hans Jenny kept going with their book, Cymatics. I've also dabbled with this in three dimensions. Here's a three-dimensional structure, cymatic structure. Here's my sculpture, Standing Waves. This cymatic structure is made with ultra-fast laser heads inside an optically perfect crystal. To achieve this imagery, approximately 5 million points were needed with spacing around 0.65 millimeter apart to give the three-dimensional waveforms. Here's a zoom in to another cymatic cube. I like to play with particles and waves. Just as we see the ocean, we see waves in the macro level, but in the micro level, we see molecules moving in waves. Same thing here, you see particles that create waves of sound. I will quote, if our eyes were more perfect, we would see atoms sing, a race of beings 
who had this sort of direct experience would no doubt include a high proportion of poets and atomic scientists. I, I like this image because it's just like a, a little snapshot of our invisible universe. I think we are surrounded by these harmonic waves. I've also played with two-dimensional sound in terms of paintings and other 2D images. Kandinsky, one of my heroes. The idea of music appears everywhere in Kandinsky's paintings. He believed shades resonated with each other to produce visual chords and had an influence on the soul. Here, Kandinsky plays also with harmony, harmony in color and how these colors interact to play visual chords, which is very interesting. I made this image of repetition of sound, and I'll quote Kandinsky here with, repetition is a potent means of heightening the inner vibration and is, at the same time, a source of elementary rhythm, which in turn is a means to attainment of elementary harmony in every form of art. Again, Johannes Kepler, the rhythm of life. Here we see repetition and I, the harmony and, and rhythm, they all bind and come to be one. Here's my painting, harmonics, and you can see the waveforms traveling in space. I know most of you are familiar with silkscreen, but I wanted to show a little video of the process, if I may. There we go. But that video shows how I'm putting the, the screen on top. Um, I mean, putting the screen on top of the um, canvas and creating this uh, painting. But I also play with particles and come into waveforms. I use halftone technique with this mesh to have very small dots. And then when you zoom out, you see the, the waveforms. Here's how it looks with a gradient from violet to white. Here's another painting called Spectral Displacement. And I played a chord, and then I extruded the information to accentuate the harmonics. You can see this in two other paintings at Hyde Park Art Center right now. There's another chord, C chord, and I used sine waves to imprint this on a wood panel. This is called polyrhythmic abstraction. Here, I used a drum machine and I applied African polyrhythms on that drum machine. And when I was seeing the information on a matrix, I took a snapshot and I vectorized where there was more energy and where there was less energy. This is rhythm on a painting. This is also still screen on canvas. Rhythm is a big part of my craft. I find it amazing that we can move to sound and how with, with space there's cadences and how we have our internal rhythm, our internal clock, how we talk when we walk. I find it amazing that rhythm is a big thing in our life. Here's gradient modulation where you can see a lot of waveforms that are the same yet they're different. They never repeat. Here's an installation I did this year with the Louisville Orchestra and um, the Kentucky College for Arts and Design. But with that installation, I had 72 musicians um, or more, and I was shooting 20,000 lumens with four projectors. So musicians were very happy with me. They had to read music at the same time and they were playing Bella Bartok, but you know, we agreed to a middle ground. It was great and um, it was a total success. I was very happy with that installation. Um, the geometries were displaced by the dynamics of the orchestra. So the louder they played, the geometries were more displaced and you could see less of the orchestra. And when they play softer, more piano, you could, you could see more of the orchestra. I'm coming to the end here, but what's 
my search of death. I have a whole world to explore and my life won't be enough. I know that already. So there's some frustrations, but the, there's some things that I, I'm very happy with and I, I'm very excited every morning to create this. Right now, my concerns are in structural components, virtual spaces, clusters of sound, cloud density, microsound, scattering particles, noise, materials, installations, and more. All art is made by our emotions and our thoughts. Emotion causes motion, which is a state of flow. And it brings me back to our theme, flow. What does flow mean to me? To me, it means a sense of total absorption, concentration, action awareness, distortion of time, and intrinsical enjoyment. It's exactly those three hours where you were doing something creative and suddenly you're like, what, what time is it, really? I, that feeling for me is one of the best feelings. All these elements come into play when I'm creating art. So no matter the outlet, I truly believe that this is the meaning of happiness, being fully immersed in your craft, a true state of harmony. So thank you very much.